Hey everybody, welcome to Triviality. This is episode one of Triviality Behind the Trivia. Yeah, Behind the Trivia. It's kind of our own version of uh, VH1's Behind the Music. Uh, What we'd like to do is bring uh, you guys uh, information straight from the well, so to speak, Um, bringing in actors, perhaps athletes, musicians, Mm -hmm. people who have trivia about them that uh, want to share it with the world and uh, tell some stories and then maybe a- uh, ask some questions. So, Neil, why don't you uh, introduce our guest today? Yeah, so uh, special thank you to uh, our friend Justin Shady, uh, a listener and uh, a great collaborator of mine. Uh, he is good friends with an actor that you've seen countless times, we're sure. His name is Mark Metcalf. Uh, you might know him as the maestro on Seinfeld, the master on Buffy the Vampire Slayer, or his turns in Animal House as Niedermeyer. Uh, and uh, many, many other films. And uh, he was gracious enough to uh, give us some time today. And uh, we're going to see how much he knows about the characters that he played. Yeah, so let's go uh, straight to that conversation. Recorded in Chicago, Illinois, with your hosts, Ken, Matt, Neil, and Jeff, this is Triviality. The cream of the crop! All right. Well, we have a very special guest with us today. His name is Mark Metcalf. He's an actor you've seen in many, many projects with a career spanning TV, film, theater, and everything in between. You might know him as the maestro on Seinfeld, the master from Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and from films Animal House, One Crazy Summer, and many, many more. Uh, we'd like to welcome Mark on the show. How's it going? Good, good. Thanks. Thanks uh, Thanks for the welcome. Oh, of course. Uh, we're and the warm introduction. <laughs> well, we need some warmth over here in Chicago. It's it's uh, a yeah. pretty cold actually. Today's not too bad, That's, but yeah, our winter has been unseasonably really? no, warm. It's nice down here where <laughs> I am. Yeah, it's not, it's not too bad. We're uh, we're we're excited that it's not snowing and slushy. Uh, well, yeah. we uh, we're excited to have you on the show. We're all fans of your work. Uh, you've you've done so much across your career uh, as far as uh, television. You've been in many 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 episodes of television and movies. And uh, what we thought would be fun is to not only talk to you about your career and, and interview about uh, some of your favorite moments, but then in between sprinkle some trivia for our listeners and see how well you know your own roles that you were performing and see if, uh, if you know those questions. Yeah. In a way that's, we'd like to, good. in a way we'd like to go I, straight to the well for the wealth of trivia information for our listeners and then, you know, throw some questions at you too. Well, my will may be dry cause I tend to forget <laughs> what I did as soon as I'm on to the next thing. But uh, uh, we'll see. I've I've been on the road doing Animal House stuff for this year because it's the 40th anniversary. Wonderful. Or last year. And uh, so I've answered a lot of questions about Animal House and heard a lot of stories. But the fans tend to know more than I do. Especially about stuff like Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Well, yeah, that's a very very dedicated fan base for that show. well, yeah, since, since you're traveling for, for Animal House, uh, we don't have to ask too many questions of that since you've been uh, dealing with it this last year, but why don't you just, I guess, off the top of your head, um, maybe just a, an anecdote about Animal House, maybe something that uh, a lot of people don't know or something you like to share about the filming process. Well, that's the thing. When I start telling an Animal House story, I realize I've probably told this story 40 times in the last year <laughs> for an interview or for a, a Q&A or something. So I think everybody knows all of them. I'm trying to, I don't know if there's one that nobody's ever heard before. The most, I guess the, the, the most popular one is uh, a story about Animal House is when I, people always say, how did you get cast? And I auditioned like everybody else, although I didn't actually audition. I was called into to interview or and audition for the part of Otter, the Tim Matheson part. Mm-hmm the guy who gets all the girls, and I'd read the script, so I thought, oh, this would be fun, i get all the girls. <laughs> I go in, I walk in the room, John Landis is in there, Michael Chinich, who was the casting director on it, was in there, and um, uh, Landis looks at me, as soon as I got in the door, he looks at me and he says, do you know how to ride? And I knew what he was talking about, because I'd, I'd read the script, so I knew he was talking about the character Niedermeyer, and I said, without missing a beat, of course I know how to ride, I was practically born on a horse. My mother's water broke when we were out on a trail ride, or my, she and my dad were out on a trail ride out on a ranch in Montana, and she slid off the horse. My dad delivered me in the shade of the horse, and he delivered calves, so he just delivered me, just the same thing. And then we got back on the horse and rode back in. And Landis looked at me and said, yeah, right. 
and I told him five more lies about how I knew how to ride. <laughs> and uh, and uh, he sent me home, and the next day or two days later, he called me and said, I want you to do this part. And I said, great, John, can you see if you can get some money from Universal so I can learn how to ride? <laughs> it's funny, I had an interview just like that the other day. <laughs> That's one of Ken's five lies for, yeah, right. <laughs> for today. Right. Uh, well, one of the things I know about Animal House uh, from your interviews and, and just from history uh, as a filmmaker myself is that, that that film, you guys didn't have a lot of time, you didn't have a lot of money, so you were doing limited takes. I think you might have said maybe one to four right. takes per uh, per setup. But what was it like doing that film at a young age uh, and doing that film coming from uh, the film Julia that you appeared in with uh, Vanessa Redgrave uh, and, uh, you know, shot by Douglas Slocum, sort of a, an Oscar-winning film? Right, yeah. Uh it was well. How was it? It was. Um, how was it? it? I'm trying to think of how it was different. It was different because the story was different. The cast it was different. I had more to do in Animal House, obviously, than I had to do in Julia. However, shooting in England with a European crew, uh, a British crew, Fred Zinnemann as a director, they they have a much more civilized way of going about things. You you actually break for tea at eleven o'clock in the morning, and a little snack, and then you break for lunch, and then you break for afternoon tea, and then you're done and at dinner by six o'clock. And I mean it's a much shorter day. You tend to work a long hard day in American filmmaking, and we did long days. <clears throat> I don't think we did any eighteen hour days uh, on Animal House. We did some long days. Uh, on on Buffy the Vampire Slayer television, I did a couple of twenty two hour days. Wow! Because I was sitting and sitting in the chair getting makeup for five hours right. put on, and then an hour and a half to get it off. So that made my day longer than everybody else's. But uh, twenty two hours is a long time to sort of be up and focused and working. So Julia was, and it's you know, work at Fonda is uh, and Redgrave. I didn't work. One on one with Redgrave. I did one on one scene with Fonda. I'm not in the film anymore. I got cut out of it. It was about ten days before they opened. They, uh, uh, Zinnerman called me and said we had to cut your your scene. I had one scene with Fonda, uh, and we had to cut your scene because they insist we cut 20 minutes out of the film. So we cut your scene and we cut half of Meryl Streep's scenes, and uh, so she's still in it, but. It vaguely, but I'm and I'm not in it at all. I think I'm referred to once, but uh, so it, it it was. I don't know. It was a transition. Animal House was a great shoot because it was all people working at the same level. There were no movie stars. Everybody was just a journeyman actor. Even Belushi was not a big star yet. He'd done one season, I think, or two seasons of of uh, Saturday Night Live. Matheson had done some television shows, but. He was in over his head because he was doing comedy for the first time, and he knew it, and he wanted to do that, and he wanted to stretch himself. So we were all working at the same level, and Landis made it very clear that he that there were no stars, and he didn't. He you know he fought Universal; they wanted to put some movie stars in it or television stars in it because they hated the script and they uh, uh, they just wanted to pack it. They thought the only way this thing is going to make any money is if we put a bunch of stars in it and they wanted to do a Saturday Night Live picture so they wanted Danny Aykroyd to play D-Day they wanted uh, Chevy to play Otter they wanted all kinds of and, and Landis fought against that because he really wanted people working at the same level and uh, and that was different than uh, than um, Julia because uh, you had Robards you had Redgrave you had uh, Fonda you had a lot of movie stars who and, and movie stars aren't as bad as sometimes I make them sound like <laughs> I've worked with Tom I've worked with Tom Arnold and he makes it about as bad as it possibly can be. Well so um, so his the his work ethic uh matched the name of the movie I suppose that you appeared in with him. Yeah. I don't think ethic is belongs in that sense <laughs> at all. Well, I understand yeah, a, lo no. a lot of the driving right. force but behind uh, Animal House actually getting made uh is uh due to Donald Sutherland's star power at the time. And and his ass, I suppose, uh, per the well, Simpsons. Yeah, but... I mean that's that's yeah. They they kept insisting that they put somebody in there. So Landis finally called Donald because he knew him from uh, 
I think Dirty Dozen, Landis had worked as a stuntman and uh, just general gopher on Dirty Dozen, which I think they shot in Romania or something like mm-hmm. that. And uh, gotten to know Sutherland and became friends with him. And Sutherland was doing uh, Invasion of the Body Snatchers in, um, where, in San Francisco with Brooke Adams. And uh, Landis said, I got to have that star. They, they, they're going to cut me off if you don't. If somebody doesn't come and be in this movie, who's a movie star, you're a movie star. Could you come do two days? We'll fly up here. You can shoot Friday afternoon. You can shoot Saturday. We'll have you back home on Sunday so you can go back to work on, on uh, uh, what did they say, Invasion of the Body Snatchers. So he, uh, so he came up and they gave him a choice of making, I think, like ten thousand dollars a day, or. Five thousand. I can't. I don't remember exactly what the numbers were. But they you know, quoted him a price: ten thousand dollars a day, or you can work for scale and have a piece of the movie, a percentage of the movie. And Sutherland read the script and he said, "I'll take the the cash up front." <laughs> and now he whoops. He kicks himself because apparently somebody did the numbers once. He would have made something like eight million dollars if he'd taken a percentage of it. <laughs> Uh, as opposed to making twenty million, twenty thousand dollars for work in two days. Yeah, I'm sure Robert Downey Jr. never uh, regrets taking the percentage on the Marvel movies. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Landis always says the two highest paid creatures in the movie were Sutherland and my horse, the horse I rode, <laughs> which, which was paid more than I was. Well, uh, on that movie, you got to interact a little bit with uh, Karen Allen. That was her first movie. What was that experience oh, like? Because yeah. she ended up, you know, being uh, just a great star, Marion Ravenwood, and, and other film star man. Yeah, I rode out on a plane with Karen from New York. She was in Washington D.C., but she came up to New York, and we took a plane together, red eye, I think, out. And so we got to Eugene in the morning, and uh, or mid afternoon, mid morning. And uh, by the time I got there, I was in totally in love with her because she's just so beautiful and and uh such a great clean head on her and uh so yeah she was great to work with and i mean and still is i mean i've done these reunions these mini reunions she's done a number of them she arranged for a bunch of us to come up to uh pittsfield massachusetts where she lives and uh and knits she has a, a company that, that she uses uh, Japanese looms and makes really beautiful scarves and sweaters and and things, really beautiful, intricate designs. And she runs that company, does the design, and does most of the of the looming herself. And uh, she had us up there for the Berkshire Film Festival or something like that. She's Karen's great. I can't tell you any dirty stories about it. <laughs> no, that's okay. Uh, I, w- I wish I could, but I, I wouldn't. Even. <laughs> uh, well, I, I guess uh, we'll throw a, a little trivia question in here because this one our listeners might okay. appreciate. Um, so uh, Doug Niedermeyer in Animal House uh, was in the ROTC, and it's kind of a two-part question. I'm sure you remember what his rank was. A sergeant at arms. Sergeant at arms, and uh, we looked it up. Uh, do you know what sergeant is? Uh, or sergeant is derived from a Latin word meaning what? That's a tough I have one. No Neil. idea. It is a tough <laughs> and one. I took Latin in high school. I should know, shouldn't I? I don't know. What is it? Uh, apparently, it's servant. Servant. Ah, well, that's that's Niedermeyer all over again. <laughs> <laughs> He's a servant of the people. I'm only here to teach and serve. Um, uh, no I, kidding. That's okay. Good. That's what it is. You know what is mid, you know what his middle initial is C. He's Douglas C. Niedermeyer, Sergeant at Arms. You know what the C stands for? I was actually going to ask you because I don't know what. Yeah, what is it? Clark. I, I picked it because of uh, there was a general in the World War II. I think Douglas Clark, Clark with his, with a E on the end. C L A uh, C L A R K E. I think it is. I can't remember, but that's what I did. Well, speaking of uh, of uh, Niedermeyer's rank, uh, it seems he got a promotion in another film uh, where you kind of yeah. kind of played the same character. Uh, can you tell us about that? Uh, in the Stupids, you mean? Yes, exactly. <laughs> Is that what you're referring to? Exactly. Yeah, in yeah. fact, I, I do. We even gave. He's called the Colonel in the script, but uh, Landis and I again talked about it because I when I did the Twisted Sister videos, which which clearly revitalizes the character, brings the character back to life. I got letters from Universal saying, you can't do that. 
we own that character, you don't own that character. If you do it again, we'll sue you. Now, a couple of weeks after I got that first letter, uh, Twisted Sister D. Snyder called me and said, we want to do another video. <laughs> Can you do it? And I said, sure, let's go. <laughs> so I just ignored what they, uh, what Universal said. But so Landis and I talked about that, and I said, you know, he, this guy, look, he's so much like Niedermeyer. And people are not going to look at me doing it and not think of Niedermeyer. So let's just call him Niedermeyer. So my name tag in The Stupids, if you've ever seen it, and if you haven't, you should, because it's really very funny. Anyway, oh, so we named him Niedermeyer. We put the name tag on him for Niedermeyer, and Universal didn't say anything. I think probably because nobody saw The Stupids, whereas everybody saw the Twisted Sister videos probably hundreds of times because it played every five minutes on MTV back in the days when there was such a thing as MTV. Was Dee Snyder just a, a big fan of yours? Is that how you got involved with that or is it uh, an audition or how did that work? No, it was a, he was a big fan. They, the band loved the, loved the movie and they loved the character. They used to quote the character uh, all the time in their, in their, when they were, as a, they were a bar band up and down the Hudson River and all over Long Island and they quoted him, so when Atlantic Records gave him some money to make a video, they said, let's get Niedermeyer. He's a sneaky little <laughs> like you, just like us. And uh, so they uh, uh, they called me up and got me. I didn't know. I didn't have it. I had a black and white TV that barely worked. Uh, I didn't know anything. I didn't know what MTV was. I actually I, I didn't li- I didn't know what Twisted Sister was as a band. I didn't know what headbanger rock and roll was. And when Beethoven died, I stopped listening to popular music. <laughs> and uh, so I didn't know w- w- anything about that. But so, but they said, we'll fly out to L.A. to shoot this thing. We can't pay you much. We can, And I said, can you pay me at least SAG wages, day wages? And they said, yeah, but we can't be SAG. So I did it outside the union, for which I also got in trouble. But the union couldn't have done it anyway because they didn't have a contract at that time for music videos now they do um they threatened to throw me out of the union for doing the video too yeah so i yeah so i i yeah i brought him back to life and i built i being an actor i built this whole backstory because you know he says it says he's killed in vietnam by his own troops and then landis in the twilight zone movie there's a uh overhead shot of some soldiers going through the jungle he shot an uh, a, it was, I don't know if you remember the Twilight Zone movie, but I think it was three different episodes of Twilight Zone. One shot by Landis took place in Vietnam. One shot, uh, uh, I can't remember that really great. Spielberg did the, uh, Spielberg did one, and uh, Spielberg did one with uh, the old folks home, and then they also had uh, the one on the plane with John Lithgow. Yeah, the one on the plane with John Lithgow. That's the one I remember. I do, did Spielberg direct that one? I know he produced it. I don't know that he directed the other one. He did the, um, yeah, it was, uh, I think it was called Kick the Can. Really? Uh, it had Catman Scruthers in it, I believe. Uh, the John Lithgow okay. one was the uh, the director of uh, of uh, Mad Max. Mad George, Max, George right. Miller. I his name. I George can't Miller. right now. Australian guy. Yep. Yeah, I remember that anyway, one. Anyway, in, Land- in Landis's version, he has his soldier, one of the soldiers say, we should never have killed Niedermeyer. <laughs> so I decided that Niedermeyer didn't actually die when they threw the grenade into his tent. Uh, he swam up river and lived with Kurtz from Apocalypse Now <laughs> in Cambodia for several years until that all blew up. The horror. At the end of Apocalypse Now. And then he built himself a raft, paddled back across the Pacific and sailed across the Pacific because uh, he had so many skills that he'd learned from Brando in the in the jungle, uh, and re-enlisted in the army and became a colonel, and that's how he ended up in the stupids. So, that's maybe so many years maybe later. he played a couple rounds of Russian roulette with uh, Chris Walken as well. <laughs> that's right, that's right. And uh, yeah, I did. I went to Walken. I was his. Uh, I held his. Uh, yeah, I held his water for him while he was uh, <laughs> at the table, and occasionally would sit in for him. Yeah. Uh, well, um, what's funny about you, you mentioning, I was actually going to ask what, what uh, Niedermeyer's demise was, according to Animal House, about being killed by his own troops. But 
Um, just right. a, a fun little thing here. There's uh, two other characters you did early on. I'm just curious to see if you remember how they died. Uh, you uh, you were on Hill Street Blues for a short period of time. Yeah. Uh, played sort of a, a slimy uh, officer there. Um, do you remember yeah. how you were murdered on that show? Yeah, I had my throat cut by a hooker trying to get, I was trying to get a freebie in the back of the <laughs> van. Busting her in the van, and I was trying to get a freebie, and she cut my throat. That's yeah. right. That's right. Uh, and then another what a one. way to go out. <laughs> I mean, as they say, there are no free lunches. So. Well, if I'd only been in the saddle when she cut my throat, that would have been one thing. That would have been not, not a bad way to go out. But I don't think I was, <laughs> as they say, in the saddle the way John Garfield was when he died. Well, speaking of being in the saddle, uh, I believe you yeah. died in the saddle in the final terror. Oh, yes. That's the movie in which I had my genitalia separated from my body at the moment of orgasm <laughs> with Cindy Harrell on a cold, pebbly beach next to a creek in the, in the uh, redwood forest up around Crescent City, California. I remember more than I think. We, you guys are hitting on some of the highlights. So. <laughs> because having your genitalia separated from your body in the moment of orgasm is not something you forget easily. I haven't seen that movie, but I'm going to now. <laughs> Well, it had Daryl Han- young Daryl Hannah on it. You Excellent. should see it. I swear you can see the genitalia flying through the air <laughs> when Joe Pantoliano comes out of the woods. Joey with Pants is in it? That's to his arm. That hacks me up the middle while I'm... What's I great mean, about... Not literally, because we were acting. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was directed by Andrew Davis, right, uh, who did The Fugitive? Andy Davis, who did The Fugitive, yeah, and a couple other. He did the first... And the only good Steven Seagal movie, the one on the on the ship with Tommy Lee Jones. Oh, Under Siege, yeah. Under Siege, you're right, exactly. Yeah. Um, and uh, so yeah. great so, cast, Daryl Hannah. Yep. Is in it, and I just saw a woman. I just watched last night, Tears of the Sun. I'd seen it before with uh, Bruce Willis, and mm-hmm. not a bad movie, but not a good movie either. But you know, I, Willis does more interesting work. But anyway, a woman named Akusia Busio who was a princess in from some African country, was also in Final Terror, and she's in Tears of the Sun. Um, Rachel Ward, John Friedrich, Joe Pant, Joey Pants. It was a good cast. Yeah, you had a lot of young uh, young talent there who, who uh, did yeah. a great job. And Joe Roth, who went on to run Disney for a while, was the producer. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, he and his wife, uh, uh, what's your name, Arkoff, I can't remember her name, Diane, I can't remember who was the daughter of Samuel Arkoff, who was the king of slasher movies, and they produced it. And when I had my genitalia separated from my body at the moment of orgasm, sentence that I obviously love to say, uh, <laughs> she was the one, besides Andy and Cindy and myself, she was on set, and she was she was charged with mopping up the blood from between my, my legs when we had to redo a retake. Because Joe would come out with this... Uh, axe attached to his arm and there was rigged it was rigged so blood would come out of it so you could get it all in one him hacking me and uh um and blood would show up and uh so we when we had to do a retake uh, she would i can't remember her name well that's the beauty of independent movies you know yeah have a little more fun that's a movie i haven't seen but like i said i'm, I'm gonna get right on that because that sounds like a like a blast new, there's a a, a blue a new a recently released blu-ray version of it which i haven't seen either it's a good story about that movie because they took it away basically roth joe took it away from andy davis because his father-in-law said you've got to have blood in the first 10 minutes of any movie like this and and andy didn't he was sort of making a slasher movie but not making it purely by the formula he was really more interested in character and if you look at it the way it was cast and the way it's played the characters really are what it's about but the producers said it's got you gotta have blood so they took joe uh, andy off of it and joe shot this scene with a a biker and his girlfriend in the same forest uh sometime before and they get both get killed bloodily and that and no explanation for it. They're just biking on a motorcycle through the wood, through the forest, and uh, they get they get killed. And then they shot reshot. No, they didn't reshoot anything. They reshot that, and then they re they re-edited. We went in to do looping ADR, uh, and we would say lines that weren't in the script at all, 
and they they had cut it so that we said them when the the camera was at our backs rather than mm-hmm. seeing our mouths. It changed the plot microscopically, but something they thought they had to do. Andy's name is still on it, but uh, Joe Roth had a lot to do with that. But anyway, I'm curious. I, I haven't seen the new Blu-ray. I want to see it again. I haven't seen it for a long yeah, time. We'll, we'll scoop that one up. Yeah, I think we'll have to. Yeah. But what I have seen is your uh, turn as the maestro in Seinfeld, which is arguably yeah. one of your, your more prevalent roles. Um, how did that come about? Uh, audition just like uh, just like everybody, like 500 or 1,000 other people, actors in, in L.A. did at the time for that part because everybody wanted to be on Seinfeld. Yeah. And uh, I went in, and I think the first audition was on a Wednesday, and they called me back on a on Friday to do it again. And I figured by the end of the day, Friday, I'd hear yes or no, and I didn't hear anything. So I figured if you don't hear anything, that's a no. So I went on about my business. And uh, then Saturday, I think it was, I got a call from my agent saying they want to see you again on Sunday. And they start working on this thing on Monday. And can you go in? So I drove in. I was living up in Port Wainimi, which is Sort of where the C, uh, Navy CB base is, up in uh, just up 55 miles north of LA. I was living up there at the time because it was just prettier. And uh, so I drove in on Sunday and auditioned once again for Larry and Jerry and all the writers, and then came home. And then later Sunday night, they called me and said, "Can you be here tomorrow morning at 10 to shoot it?" So, I mean, I did. I auditioned just like everybody else, but there were probably I don't know, 500 or 100 or 2,000 people auditioned wow. to begin with, and they whittled it down. And I was real lucky and happy to get it because it was it's a great show. And it's great working with millionaires. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and and were, you surpri- yeah. were you surprised by, the, like, kind of the legacy of that character? Or by the time you were on it, you kind of knew, you know, that these characters kind of take on a life of their own a little bit? Well, I I what I didn't watch the show that much because I didn't really watch that much TV, so I I was aware of it and I was aware of how popular it was. I did not think, I mean, people stop me and recognize me from it, and they ask me about it, and they they're surprised that it was only two episodes because they think so. The character did, did make a strong impact, and I don't think I realized that at the time some of the writers came up to me and said this is one of our favorite characters that we've ever written and they were in the seventh season so they'd worked on a lot of characters so i i knew that they thought it was good and i wanted to do it justice and and uh but basically i just played it i didn't think i wasn't thinking ahead a lot and people always say did you know when you made animal house that it would be and i become an iconic movie be in the American Film Institute's 100 Best Movies be in the Library of Congress as a movie that represents America at its best. It's the, mo- the movie's everywhere, and people always ask me whether or not I think. No, of course not. Nobody knew. that we didn't, we don't, You don't work that way. You don't work thinking, oh, well, there people are going to be talking about this 40 years from now. You just do, you just do the job. Do the work, yeah. Well, one person who's yeah, certainly yeah. still talking about the maestro is uh, one of our listeners, Matt Coleman. Who who was he the the winner of that Seinfeld? He was play the, on me? Yes, he was. Yeah, he's a huge Seinfeld fan. He actually provided a oh, few good. a few uh, Seinfeld trivia questions regarding your character. If you can uh, humor us for a moment, and I can ask these from Matt. Sure. All right. Yeah. So, so his first question is: Bob Cobb adopted the moniker of cool. Maestro after observing I don't which. Like it when you- Say that name. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Which real life conductor? I still have an automatic response. To that. <laughs> go ahead. He, he adopted the moniker of the maestro after observing which real life conductor being referred to as maestro? Leonard Bernstein. Yeah, that's right. Or Bernstein, depending on where you are. All right. Yeah, that, yeah that's absolutely right. Uh, second question it was from good enough for Lenny. It should be good enough for me. I do right. remember more than I think I remember. Oh, I, I think I think you're going to get a lot of these. Um, the uh, second question uh, Matt has here is, the maestro owns a villa in Tuscany, an area which Jerry and Kramer discuss as being the size of which U.S. state, even though, for the record, Tuscany is roughly one-seventh the size in real life? Oh, wow, you got me on that. They say it's the size of New York? I don't know. What do they say? I, I believe don't they know. say it's the size of North Dakota. North Dakota. <laughs> <laughs> so not that exactly would correct. That but... wouldn't it, right? <laughs> That's uh, okay. Good. Yeah, you got me. I didn't know that one. I forgot that. 
And the third one here from Matt is, uh, while he's referred to in the episode as the other guy, which was the maestro's favorite of the three tenors? Oh, you're going to get me on this one, too. Pavarotti, Demi... Uh... Right, the other guy. <laughs> yeah, the other guy. The other guy. Oh, I don't know. I'm uh, blanking. His name is Jose Carreras. Jose Carrera, okay, and who's the, and then who is the third one, Domingue? Is it, it no? Oh, you got me. Yeah, the Pavarotti, other. Pavarotti, Carrera, <laughs> and who? I, I knew Carrera from the question in Pavarotti because of Pavarotti, but uh, who, I, yeah. I feel like he should get credit for the other guy. I mean, it, you know, it's, that was. Uh, the other, other guy. Yeah, the other, <laughs> the other, other guy. guy. It was uh, uh, Placido Domingo. Oh, yeah. Domingo. Placido Domingo. I, I know it was yeah. Domingo. I thought it was Dominguez or Domingo. Okay, good. I believe I it's it was, I knew Placido. It was Placido. Yeah. All right, Matt asks, when Elaine attempts to give the maestro an autograph... Tell Matt congratulations on getting me. (laughs) All right, right, we'll do that. The the maestro says, congrats, Matt. I should send him a signed baton. (laughs) Oh, I'm sure he'd love that. But I don't have any. (laughs) Those aren't cheap either, those those conducting batons. You know Larry Thomas, the uh, the the soup Nazi? Yeah. He gets... He gets... He goes. He sends away to the uh, internet and uh, the all-powerful internet, and gets ladles, and then he signs them. No soup for you, and sells them. He gets them for twenty-five cents a piece, and then sells them for fifty bucks or something like that, for a lot of money. Yeah, uh, he was doing that a few years ago. I don't know if he's still doing it or not. Yeah, he was. He was and a. He, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead. No, you go ahead. No, no. I was just no, gonna say. Going. He, <laughs> no, I was just gonna say he was a a really nice guy. We uh we were gonna do a movie when I was pretty young. I was twenty years old, and uh, it was about a sort of the end of blockbuster. Uh, and he was gonna be in the film, and we did a um a little fundraiser here in our small town, and uh, he was uh, signing soup cans and uh, and pictures here. So it just goes to show <laughs> that some of these characters, you know, on a TV series can, you know, outlast uh, what you believe they would. It's amazing. It's amazing, and, he, and he's really made. He, uh, I don't know how much he works as an actor, but he, uh, he's really made a career out of being the soup Nazi. And that was one episode. So I mean, that that says a lot about how great the writing was of that show. Well, speaking of uh, of really good writing, um, just to transition here, uh, Jeff is a yeah. huge fan of Joss Whedon, and uh, you know we have a few uh, questions here that our friend Jen Keep wrote about the Master, but. Uh, why don't you just tell us, uh, you know, what's, what was it like working with Joss? Uh, what, what was the set like? Was it to our listeners? That's uh, that's Buffy. Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, Joss is a genius. Obviously, I mean, I don't know. Maybe not be obvious to people who haven't seen his work, but I think he's a genius. And uh, as a writer and as a producer, and uh, so it was great working with him. Uh, there's a lot of Buffy stories that I won't bore you with, but. Uh, the the set for me was pretty isolated, and I kind of wanted it that way because, as I said, it took five and a half hours to put the makeup on at the beginning of the season. By the end of the season, they had it down to three and a half hours. But they would put the the mask and the skull cap and the ears and the neck piece and the fingers on and the hands, and then they would paint it because when we started the season, they didn't know exactly what they wanted the colors to look like in his face. And so if you watch it. If you binge watch it from beginning to end, you'll see that that what she calls my punch bowl mouth at the end <laughs> sort of evolves. It's not there at the beginning, but it's there at the end. And um, so I was pretty isolated because I was inside this this mask all the time, and it took a long time to get in it. And I used that time as a kind of a meditation to sort of get into a not a trance-like state, but a, just sort of isolate myself like the master was pretty isolated under the uh under the in that church under sunnydale or whatever the town is called um but josh was very receptive i when in the script because i was in the very big first episode excuse me in the script he has the master with sort of long stringy black hair and i was uh a fan of the murnau movie nosferatu and i i brought him some pictures of of uh, Nosferatu, and I thought maybe Josh, we could go sort of pick up some of the the history of vampires in film and cinema, and uh, maybe we could just through, show some, just do some echoes of Nosferatu instead of 
this long stringy black hair that you've got and he liked that idea so the the makeup the way it looked was a, a it was a combination of his idea and my idea and what we wanted to do the costume was the leather costume was also a little bit out of Nosferatu but uh, well it's a classic vampire you gotta gotta reference that one one, one of the yeah. more frightening iterations the, of I vampires think, too I think he's the first vampire ever filmed and he's yeah the, he, until the master. He was the oldest and meanest vampire. We made the, <laughs> I always say the master is the oldest and meanest vampire because he's 800 years old, and I think Nosferatu is only 600 years old or something. Like he's that. a youngster. So, yeah, he's still young. Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah, I deserve respect because I'm older. <laughs> and it's been widely noted that uh, Neil always had that uh, Sarah Michelle Gellar poster in his... Oh. Work, workout room was it? Yeah. So, you, Mark, you don't know this, but I, I often reference uh, when I was younger, I had a workout room in our basement, and uh, to try to get into shape, I had a poster of Sarah Michelle Geller because uh, I wanted to be Angel, even though I was very skinny and could not, you know, gain any muscle mass. But uh, I was a big fan of Sarah Michelle Geller when Maybe, I was younger. It, well, interviewing Mark I'm, could be the closest you ever get to meeting Sarah Michelle. That's true. Geller. That's true. <laughs> yeah, you're. That's one degree. You got one degree of separation now, right? Yeah, that's it. That's um, that's true. Yeah, she's uh, I, I, obviously. I mean, you're right. You were you were a smart kid to uh, <laughs> have a poster of her up on on your workout room. Uh, yeah, but she's she's great. She's great to work with. We only actually really only had one long scene together in the last episode, and it was uh, it was fun. She was very uh, she was very nice about it when we finished shooting. Well, what's, and, uh, what's great about that character is that Joss wrote it and, uh, you know, just such a strong female character and one who kicks ass and, yeah. you know, and uh, throws throws uh, funny quips at you when she does it. And I, I feel like, uh, you know, changed a lot of TV after that. Yeah. Oh, I think it did. I mean, I, I, I was just in London doing a convention for you talked about earlier on about uh, Buffy fans being a unique breed. I can't remember the phrase you used, but they are. They're... Uh, I was at a convention in London called Star Fury, all all about Buffy, and uh, all Buffy fans. They do it once a year. Uh, I've been over there, I think, three times for Buffy for these guys, and you know, over the what twenty twenty one years, twenty two years since I did it in ninety seven. And this tight, really tight knit group of fans that come together at these conventions more for the, each other than they do for us. They're happy that we're there, but they just, it's, they get to see each other and they come from all over Europe from, uh, I think we had one, a woman from Romania, in fact, and Italy and Greece and, and a couple from France. And the kind of really wonderful thing at this convention anyway, was I would guess 50 to 60% represented the lgbtq community because he josh just there's a this generosity of spirit that and that empowered this young woman in the film also goes a long way towards empowering lots of as we say marginalized groups of people and marginalized individuals and just says yes to them rather than the no that society classically has said and and it's a big part of you know of whatever evolution this country and this culture in this country is going through now and more obvious we're always going through it but more obviously going through with the me too movement and never again and uh, a lot and uh, just the way young people are are speaking up the part of the kids from parkland yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, Joss has always been really great about that in his in his work. And uh, yeah. but um, speaking of uh, uh, Joss's rabid fans, one of those is our good friend Jen Keep, and uh, she wrote you some questions here. She did. Yeah, sure. uh, <clears throat> tragically for for our sake, and we had to thank Jen for this. Ken and I, who are both Joss Whedon fans, have never actually seen Buffy. It's like my Joss Whedon shame. So right. Uh, <laughs> How could well? That, 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 I, I don't think I can keep talking to you. That's fair. <laughs> Sorry, I have to go have root canal. Um, You'd have rather have um, a root canal than continue this conversation. That's what a lot of people say to Jeff when they're on the show that they'd rather have a root canal than play trivia with him. So. Rather have root canal. 
you guys aren't that bad. But I'm beginning to think. You've never seen Buffy. Well, all right. It's, well, leave it. Who's the Who's the woman that uh, wrote the question? It's a friend of ours, Jen Keep. So uh, we've well, got a couple for you. Um, so uh, first question yeah. from Jen, and I think this is a good one. So right from the get-go, who did the master sire uh, appearing in the season one opener and was an integral character in the Buffyverse as far as vampire relations? Darla. Mm-hmm. Darla? Yes, is that Dar- the answer? Yeah, it is Darla. Yeah, Darla. Yeah, yeah uh, I know. It's, 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 and believe me, <laughs> uh, uh, and I like that as a verb, uh, <laughs> Julie Benz was also a whole lot of fun. Um, Julie Benz is quite something. Yeah, you guys had great chemistry. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we did. Yeah, I sired her, though. Didn't I sire her? When did I? Did I do her that on the? Did I do her on the show, or did I do her on Angel? Because in Angel, I came. They brought me back after the first season. They brought me back for, I think one ep, maybe two episodes of Angel, where I oh, because it's yeah, Dar. I already was had made Darla, and Darla makes Angel in the in the flashback episodes of Angel. Anyway, go ahead. Well, you just answered one of our other trivia questions. Great job on that one. <laughs> So you're, you're beating us to the punch. I'm uh, I'm a little bit more familiar with Julie Ben's other bloody work, which would be Dexter. So although Dexter, she's not, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, after after biting Buffy's neck to fulfill the prophecy, the master pays her what compliment before dropping her into the water? Before or after? Oh, after she's I drop her in the water. I say, by the way, I like your dress. <laughs> I think it's after I drop her in the water. That was it. Uh, very she's, smooth. She's on her way to the prom. By the way, I like your dress. Do I compliment her uh, beforehand? If I did, it would have been something about the skin on her neck. I... <laughs> <laughs> no, you're right. It was, I, by the way, I like your dress. That was it. By the way, I like your dress. Yeah, I think I think that was after I dropped her in the water, in the mud puddle. I yeah. presumably did. You know, <laughs> when I got when I was cast for the part and I went in to talk to Joss about it, um, just sort of a little conference to see. I wanted to, you know, talk to him about that Nosferatu look, and then, uh, and I said, "So, uh, what's the art?" I knew I was going to do the whole season, but that was all. It wasn't a contract for the whole, uh, the whole uh, series. So I said, "So, what's the arc through this series, through this uh, first season?" And he said, "Oh, it's really great. At the end, you kill Buffy." And I said, "Oh, wow, that'll be fun." Does that mean if it gets picked up, the second season will be called Master the Buffy Slayer? (laughs) And he laughed. But he never told me until I got the script that I killed Buffy. But then they do a little seance and they bring her back to life and she kills me. That was a surprise. I mean, I knew I had to die or go off because I hadn't been they hadn't approached me to do the next season yet but uh well at least you didn't have to do that makeup for an entire season as the lead character then well they <laughs> <laughs> and that's not the only time they've uh they've kind of pulled uh joss whedon m night Shyamalan style 180 so uh in season three after a wish gone wrong the fate of the universe is altered and the master is now alive and has taken over sunnydale which members of the gang are now vampires oh uh allison hannigan whose name i can't in the character name i can't remember but i do remember Willow. Willow. Yeah, yeah, she plays Willow. Willow, Willow. And is uh, Xander, is he also a vampire? Yes, Xander is the other one. So Xander's think... the other one, yeah. Who, who I've done, he's done a, I don't think I've seen Allison since then, but I've seen Xander, a couple, uh, Nicholas, a couple of times because he's done, he does these conventions in England, so I've seen him uh, once or twice over there. Uh, and he's quite a he's quite a funny guy and a nice guy. I like him. Uh, before we get to a few extra questions here and and, uh, and yeah. wrap up, one of the the uh, questions Jen wrote was actually to complete one of your lines, which it looks like you've you've done another one already. But uh, it said in the episode "The Wish," the master has created a factory for humans to be f- uh, fra- farmed for their blood. So the quote was: "Meanwhile, the humans with their plebeian minds have brought us a truly demonic concept." And what was that concept? I can't remember. I don't remember. She's smarter than me. <laughs> it was uh, it was mass production. Oh, oh, that, of course, mass. <laughs> That's the yeah, because that, the whole thing is this sort of factory where they bring me a body, and they put the body on a conveyor belt, and it goes through this machine, and it uh, it 
I pull a lever and my wine glass fills with blood. A little blood yes, farm. Production. Thank you, Henry Ford. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, well, we had we have a few miscellaneous questions here. Uh, I did want to okay. mention, uh, you know, you you have such a great career in the theater. Uh, you know, working with Mike Nichols uh, on. Uh, uh, in, a, in a great streamers, pl- streamers. yep. Uh, Robert Altman did the uh, the film version of that, and um, and I know you did some great work in in Milwaukee with uh, the first stage children's theater. Um, yeah. And in one production, you played the Giver in a stage adaptation. So, uh, okay. talking about the Giver story, do you remember what the first memory uh, that the Giver gives to Jonas in the story is? Oh, snow. Yeah, yeah, snow and and Is sledding. Snow and yeah. a, sle- a sleigh ride, right? Yep. That's a riding on a sled through snow. Yep, that one's asked a trivia quite often about what that first memory was. So you got that one right on the money. Um, Good. And Good. then uh, you also share a, a great a, story. I really, I really like that story. Yeah, I think the giver's and great. I, yeah, it was one of the few I read in junior high that really struck me and I liked. Um, I, I read that, uh, you know, you're also a big Shakespeare fan, like some of us here and, yeah. uh, and Hamlet was a character you said you've always would, uh, would love to play cause you've played Claudius a few times. I played Claudius twice. Yeah. Uh, and, and uh, I've done it four times. I did it with Chris Wall. I played Laertes with Chris Walken as Hamlet. I did Claudius with Mark Rylance as Hamlet. I did Marcellus. And a couple other parts with Sam Waterston as Hamlet. And then I did Claudius again down in Houston with a young actor named Ben Reed just a couple of years ago. So actually, out of those four, there's some pretty big names there and and up and coming with Ben Reed. But uh, if you had to do a two-man show version of Hamlet, uh, who would you want to do it with, with all the characters? Um, Well, probably Mark Rylance, because he's such a good actor. And he could do all the hard ones, and I could do all the easy ones. I could play Gertrude. I could play Gertrude. He could play my son. I could play the goat. Yeah, sure. I'd do it with Mark Rylance. That's a good answer. We, a phenomenal actor. we love Mark Rylance here. Um, and uh, speaking of Hamlet, uh, just a little trivia question we hear from time to time again. Uh, what character does Hamlet call a fellow of infinite jest of most excellent fancy? Uh, uh, York. York is correct. That's right. Uh, yeah, when he's when he's sitting in the grave with the grave digger and uh, and uh, reflecting on the skull of his friend. Where be your jibes now? Yeah, his friend, his, yeah, the guy who carried him, York carried him on his shoulders when he was a young boy. Yeah. Uh, and then yeah, just a, a few little uh, little questions here, uh, Jeff. You had one about a TV show. He did a three episode arc on. <laughs> yeah. So, yes, uh, in preparation for the show, I was like, I should probably look up a couple other roles just so I'm a little bit better versed. You know, the Animal House and the Maestro were the ones that I was familiar with. And uh, so I saw you did a stint as, uh, I believe, Captain Pike on JAG. And that begs the question, what the hell is JAG mean? (laughs) (laughs) Judge, advocate, general, I think. Points. Advocate, I don't know what the G is. That is that is what is I found right? to be correct. I still don't know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> but the words are correct. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the legal branch of the Navy. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm not sure they knew what it was. They, <laughs> um, uh, but but I got you know what I got to do on that on that show it was so great. Uh, we shot parts of the first two episodes on the John C. Stennis, which was a nuclear aircraft carrier out of san diego oh, wow. and they would they flew me down to san diego and then i flew on a navy plane and i can't remember what they call it uh, but it was a little you know one of those planes navy planes you don't it, the pay, you don't there's no stewardesses there's no no flight attendants they don't serve you beer and you're just strapped into a hard onto a hard wooden bench i flew on one of those out of san diego at a little airport in a navy airport in san diego on to the John C. Stennis, which was out at 60, 70 miles out at sea uh, over the horizon, and uh, and then lived on the aircraft carrier for five days while we shot uh, parts of the first two episodes, I think, wow. which was a great experience. I mean, I don't know if you guys have ever been on one of those aircraft carriers, but it's a real assault on the senses. I mean, especially when you're on deck with jet fuel in your nose all the time and it's just loud constantly loud and they put us in vip in the vip quarters 
which meant only that we had a little bit more room in our little cabin that we lived in. Uh, and a little bit is, you know, maybe a few more square inches. But we were higher up, too, so which meant our rooms were right, or my room was anyway, right under the flight deck. And they were doing night ops, so they were f- taking off and landing uh, every five minutes. And if you've ever seen a, the way they land on an aircraft carrier, there's this big, huge cable that's like two, three inches in diameter that catches the plane and stops it and then releases it so that cable gets whipped up off the deck and then gets dropped right on top of my head, it felt like, all <laughs> night long. So I didn't get a lot of sleep when we was there, but it was fun. Uh, well, another TV yeah. show that, uh, that you were on... Um which I, I'm curious to see if you remember this. I had watched it the other day. You played a character named Norval Hayes. You're kind of a, a villainous uh, villainous character who would sit in a van and try to kidnap children on Walker, Texas Ranger. Uh, do, do you remember what tactic you used to try and kidnap kids off the street? I, I wanted to play video games with them, I, if I recall correctly. I mean, that's what I wanted to do. I don't know. what Did I offer them candy? It was. You had something other thing. than candy that was alive, if that helps you out. Oh, puppies? Did I have a puppy? Yeah, yep, you had a box full of free puppies. <laughs> I box full of free puppies. That's right. All right, well, we got uh, one last question for you here. Um, you, okay. pl- you played Mr. Rope in the teen classic Drive Me Crazy in 1999. Um, between yeah. the two the two young stars of that film, I was wondering if you could uh, name some of the other sitcoms or uh, television shows that they appeared. I think they they were well, stars of three shows put together. So, Sabrina the Teenage Witch for that other three named actress, uh, Joan, Melissa Joan Hart. Absolutely, right? Is yeah. That her name? yeah. Yeah. Oh, did she did Sabrina the Teenage Witch the 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 first one, not the one that I haven't seen, that people seem to be kind of excited. Right, about right. The the Netflix the classic now. classic Sabrina. Yeah, and did she also do? Oh, somebody somebody explains it all. Yeah, Clarissa explains it all actually, and uh, she was the, she was the star all, right. of that and as then, well. And uh, Adrian, the guy with it sounds like he should be French, but he's not. Grenier, who was in Entourage. Yeah, that's right. He was the lead in yeah, Entourage. Right. What's Adrian's last name? Grenier. Grenier, Grenier yeah. Right? Yeah. And arguably yeah. Uh, should have been in the Aquaman movie based on his role in Entourage. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, he got it exactly I right. I haven't seen Aquaman, but I wonder what Adrian's doing at home in his villa in the Hollywood Hills or wherever it is. He lives off his Entourage money. Yeah, he's been doing oh. fine, I think. Uh, well, b- before, we, uh, before we wrap it up here... Um, Two two little things. Uh, one thing, uh, there's a, a, a film of yours that uh, I used to watch all the time when I was younger. I used to rent it on VHS from the video store every Tuesday. It was 99 cent rentals, uh, and I'd bring it home and watch it. I actually just watched it last night. It was up till 2 in the morning because I, I got sucked in, but it was a movie called The Heavenly Kid. Oh, yeah. Uh, you did with Lewis Smith. Dean Kazmarek and Lewis Smith. Yeah. Dean Kazmarek's in that? And- yeah. And Jason Gedrick. Yep, and Jason yeah. Gedrick. And uh, I, I was always a big fan of that movie. Um, just wanted to say that. So uh, you did a nice Thanks. little nod Thanks. to um, James Dean there in the beginning with your outfit. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I loved that part, getting to play James Dean and, and then having the whole movie be sort of from the point of view of uh, uh, who's the actor who goes over the cliff, who doesn't uh, get his leather jacket caught on the handle and in the in the uh, Rebel Without a Cause movie, and I can't remember the actor's name, but uh, yeah, it was great to do James play James Dean at the beginning with some, just the hair and the red jacket, and then uh, Jane Kaczmarek as Natalie Wood, and we get married. Yeah, and I thought it was a nice and little I, twist there I that have, yeah that you guys get married. I like that movie too, and uh, everybody always says it should have been more successful, but if it had, but it came out the same year that Back to the Future did. Yeah, and sort of Back to the Future got all the uh, the people that wanted to see magic stuff. L- little independent movie called Back to the Future. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, well, that's a gem, though. Yeah, if you guys Sorry. check that out. Uh, no, and I, I one the last thing we I thought we could end on was kind of a, an interesting story. I happened to you know do a little deep dive, and uh, our mutual friend Justin uh, talked about this a little bit. But uh, I heard you're uh, a big fan of the movie the philadelphia story and there's a fun story there about how you watched it four times in a day yeah carrie fisher and i were good friends uh back in the day right after she finished 
Star Wars, uh, I think the first one or the second one, mm. uh, or all of them, I can't remember. We were friends for a long time. And uh, she loved that movie, and I loved that movie. And we went to, the, I think, the Thalia Theater on Broadway and watched that movie. It was on a double bill. I don't even remember what the double second one was, because every time we'd watch Philadelphia Story, then we'd go over to McGlade's Bar, which is on the corner of 69th and... Uh, and uh, Amsterdam or Calais, Amsterdam, and uh, we'd have a couple of beers while the other movie was playing. Then we'd go back and pay our money again and go see Philadelphia. I think we saw it four times in one day, and we'd go back to McGlade's and drink some more and talk about the movie and and do the lines. She was I was Jimmy Stewart and she was Catherine Hepburn because uh, you have heart fires bank back beneath your eye, behind your eyes, and there's something marvelous about you. I just watched that the other night. It's a, a, such a great movie. That would have been a fun adaptation I, with you two. Yeah. It, well, we, 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 it, yeah, we had a good time. She was, Carrie was still maybe the funniest and one of the smartest people I ever spent time in a room with. Yeah, she great. seemed super witty and, and a great writer and uh, performer. Great writer, very funny, very, you know, I mean, not, you know, deeply troubled, obviously, but the best of us are deeply troubled. And, um, but she made, yeah, she made work out of it. She made it work. She made, uh, you know, yeah. And, and her mom, I was just writing to somebody, a friend of mine, the other day, she and I went out to uh, stay with her mom over Christmas once <laughs> when her mom was playing at the Sands. And we stayed, in, and, and she had a huge suite of rooms, like a whole floor or something like that. We stayed up there, and Carrie uh, introduced me to uh, to sleazy strip bars because that was back. In- <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, um, we we figured we'd we'd end the the questionnaire here on a maybe an easy question for you. Then, if you just watched Philadelphia Story, but do you remember the name of the paper that uh, Jimmy Stewart worked for uh, doing the investigation? Oh. The Star Ledger is all I can remember because that's the Newark paper, but that's not it. Um, no, I don't remember. It was Spy. Spy, Spy. Oh, yes, of course it was Spy because there was actually a magazine called Spy later in New York, and a woman I knew named, this is a good circle, uh, Nell Scoville wrote for Spy magazine, and she and I went out a little bit. And she ended up the showrunner, I think, on Sabrina the Teenage Witch. There you go. Hey, years a, later. Small world. Yeah, small hey, world. Full it's circle. A tiny little world. Well, Mark, we're tabulating yeah. your uh, your score here, and uh, with all the uh, bonus credit that you're getting for for your great stories, uh, you got 110 percent. So. 110 <laughs> percent. What's well, what can be better? A plus I plus. Say as an actor, I try to give 110 percent. Don't well, ask for more. <laughs> well, uh, we we very much appreciate you uh, spending time with us today, and um, we, you know we could probably talk to you for several hours, but uh, we'll let you get back to your uh, your daily activities. But uh, you know, thank you so much for not only giving us uh, some trivia about yourself and going behind the trivia uh, with some of your your classic roles, but uh, just giving us your time and uh, being so gracious. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, thank you. It was it was fun to do. I I didn't know what to expect, but it was uh, it was genuinely. Uh, it was fun. Uh, and I learned a few things. Well, there you go. <laughs> there you, now, now you know uh, that uh, Niedermeyer is servant at arms. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> He's the servant at arms. And I, I've been saying all my life, I'm only here to teach. And my son, especially, I'm only here to teach and serve. There you um, go. And now I know that, you know, Niedermeyer was, I was born to play Niedermeyer, I guess. <laughs> uh, uh, is, is there um, anything you'd like to, to plug for uh, listeners to check out? Or, or uh, I know you said you had a, a film coming out. Yeah, a film I made a couple of years ago called, when we made it, it was called Depth of Field. Now it's called The Field, directed by Tate Bunker, who's a director I've worked with twice. I made another movie you should check out and see if you, if you can get a hold of it, called uh, Little Red, which I think is really good and very creepy. It's sort of a, it's the Red Little Red Riding Hood story, only modern, and I play the big bad wolf with Ooh. a 12-year-old, 13-year-old uh girl scary scary there's a scene on the beach that was that's really really sick um i don't know why that makes me laugh sick makes me laugh <laughs> um but it's a good movie it's very creepy yeah we'll make sure uh, and tate, tate yeah look look for it tate directed that and then this movie's now is called the field 
And the last I heard from him, which was a month ago, was that it was going to be out in probably in theaters uh, sometime this year, this winter. I don't know. Awesome. We'll see. Yeah, we'll, we'll put a link there uh, for everyone. Yeah, well, thanks again, Mark, uh, for joining us. Yeah, thank thanks you. to my co-hosts yeah. here in the studio. And uh, thanks to our listeners for tuning in to episode one of Triviality Behind the Trivia. 